Hey everybody. In today's video, we are going to be talking about enzymes. So buckle up. Okay. Uh, enzymes. Enzymes are the continuation of the chapter on proteins that we did. Proteins, of course, being uh, made up of amino acid um, monomers. And we were talking about all the different roles that, uh, that, that proteins can play. One of them has actually has an enzyme. So we're going to talk about what enzymes are. Um, in this protein diagram here, you, if you remember, um, we said that these little coils were those alpha helixes from the one chapter we did on, uh, on the protein. So this is just a, um, a picture of cytochrome C, um, which is an oxidase. We're going to talk about the classes of um, enzyme here in a couple of minutes. Uh, an oxidase is a react, uh, an enzyme that oxidizes or that is involved in some kind of redox reaction. Um, but anyways, here is the structure of that. So an enzyme is going to function as a biological catalyst. Um, we know that there are catalysts um, that are non-biological, meaning we can add, let's say, acid to a reaction and make it go faster. Um, biological catalysts use proteins to make the reaction go faster. The catalyst is the enzyme, um, and it gets regenerated after the reaction is over. Um, some um, RNA molecules are actually also catalysts. Uh, in addition to proteins, there are RNAs. RNAs, of course, are made up of um, the DNA molecules, the nucleotides. Um, and so they are different structurally than proteins. Um, before proteins evolved, we only had RNA and DNA. So it makes sense that they would have had the ability, right? Because I don't know if we've talked about it yet, but to get proteins, you have to have DNA. DNA is what gets translated into the protein. So before there were proteins, and remember, when you're translating DNA into proteins, you need proteins to do the translating and to do the job. So where did the proteins come from if you already had to have them in order to make proteins, right? So RNAs were the ones that were making them and catalyzing. Um, they increase the reaction rate by a lot, 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 20, versus the uncatalyzed reaction. Some catalysts are specific to one unique compound. So, for example, urease is a, a rea uh, an enzyme that only acts on urea and breaks it into ammonia. So it's very specific for one molecule. Um, others are very selective for which left-handedness or right-handedness of the molecule. So we have enzymes that will specifically go after L amino acids, but not D amino acids. Um, or they'll go after D sugars, but not L sugars. Or um, certain types of bonds, alpha-1-4 bonds, as opposed to alpha-1-6 bonds, right, for our carbohydrates. Um, others go after specific compounds, specific types of compounds, specific types of bonds, and so we'll, we'll see that there's some generality there. Um, one of the ones we'll look at a little bit later is the uh, uh, trypsin. We're going to look at it in terms of its um, um, auto sort of catalyzing effects. Um, but trypsin is a uh, digestive enzyme. It's used for breaking apart proteins. Um, trypsin is very specific for breaking apart peptide bonds, um, so the bonds between amino acids, that are after lysine and arginine. So if arginine or lysine, which are both basic amino acids, if they are bonded to another amino acid, trypsin specifically finds them and cuts those bonds. So as far as um, that reaction goes, kind of looks like this. Um, so trypsin, they're not showing it. Trypsin would be the enzyme here. Um, it recognizes, right, NCC, 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 um, that this right here is a lysine. And so then it cuts the bond between lysine and whatever's next. It recognizes the arginine, cuts the bond right after that carbon. Um, and so it hydrolyzes this peptide into three pieces. And you have other, other digestive enzymes like chymotrypsin, which will go and actually cut things after aromatic residues. Um, dihydrogen bromide is another one, goes and cuts uh, internal methionine residues. Okay, so moving on. Enzymes can be classified um, a couple of different ways. Uh, first, they're often commonly named based on the reaction they do or the molecule that they um, they they catalyze, <coughs> excuse me, a reaction for. So like um, lactate dehydrogenase, now that's the name. So it tells you kind of lactate 
is the molecule um, that it's going to act on, like a lactose. Uh, and dehydrogenase probably means it's going to remove some hydrogens, right? Um, acid phosphatase, it's going to add phosphoric acid to an acid. Now, these enzymes usually end in the, in the ASE name, ACE. That's how you know it's an enzyme. I'll give you another one. Amylase. Amylase goes and catalyzes the um, hydrolysis of amylose. Okay, so that's a little bit about how they're named. They get classified into major groups. There's six of them. There are the oxidoreductases, so oxidation reduction reactions. So adding oxygens or hydrogens, removing oxygens or hydrogens, right? Um, all of these things count towards oxidation reduction. Uh, transferases, so moving a amino group from one molecule to another would be a transferase. Aminos, nitros, CO2s, carboxyls, um, hydroxyls, anything that you could move. Um, hydrolases, these hydrolyze, so they use water to cut. Oops. Lyases. Lyases add groups or remove groups. This is different. Um, the example you're going to see here a second uses water. Um, so hydrolases add water and they cut things. Lyases add water or, you know, nitros or carboxyls or it could be anything. It could be adding or removing of some groups. But again, this is to uh, create or remove a double bond. Isomerases change the form, right? So we could get, um, let's say, glucose isomerizing into fructose, right? Same molecular formula, different connections. And ligases. Ligases, the key here, costs energy. It's going to use energy, ATP, to join molecules together. Uh, here are some examples. So and in an oxidoreductase situation, we see here pyruvate is getting um, reduced. So it becomes the, the carboxyl here becomes uh, an alcohol group. So it got reduced. Lactate dehydrogenase. Um, now, uh, pyruvate here got oxidized, um, but lactate is what was formed, right? Notice that pyruvate was the molecule before, and now it's called lactate after, right? Lactate dehydrogenase would also work on lactate and remove that hydrogen to make pyruvate again. So enzymes can sometimes catalyze both direction reactions. Um, sometimes there's also different enzymes that do different jobs, but an example of an oxidoreductase. A transferase, here's a transferase. Um, this one uh, takes an aspartate and transfers an amino group. So the aspartate here, alpha ketoglutarate is here. We're gonna get transfer from one to the other. Um, the amino group in question is right here on our aspartate. Um, once that aspartate loses it, aspartate is now oxaloacetate. Once alpha ketoglutarate gains that amino, so we're going to see it changing from here to here, it becomes glutamate. All right, so hopefully you can't hear my children screaming in the background. Um, so that's that's a transferase, a hydrolase. Hydrolase is one that uses water to cut. So here, um, and as an example, acetylcholine can be um, um, hydrolyzed. We, we recognize that there's an ester bond here, so we can get a carboxylic acid um, and an alcohol from this, uh, depending on the conditions, of course. Um, looks like we're gonna get the carboxylate salt or the carboxylate ion and the alcohol. So this must be in you know pH neutral or basic conditions, because we're not gonna get the carboxylic acid back. But again, water cutting. Um, so that's a hydrolase. So we've got a lyase. So a lyase, remember, um, is going to um, remove or add a double bond. And so here we see a double bond. In this case, water is added to the double bond. And now we have um, no double bond. So um, ac uh, aconitase actually turned cis-aconitate into isocitrate in this example. So that's a lyase. 
Isomerases change um, just the, the, the connectivity of a molecule. They don't add or remove any atoms. So in this case, we have phosphohexose isomerase. So this is a phosphorylated hexose, so a six carbon sugar. Um, and it's going to get turned from a pyranose into a furanose, right? The, the, the ring shape, six membered ring into a five membered ring. Um, a ligase. Ligases use ATP energy um, to catalyze their reactions. Um, in this case, um, L-tyrosine and a tRNA get added together to be L-tyrosine or tyrosyl tRNA. So that's the complex. It's what we call an activated tRNA. And uh, it costs some ATP. So one of those phosphates is liberated, AMP, uh, sorry, AMP is liberated, and the two other phosphates go off as inorganic phosphate. All right, so hydrolases, uh, isomerases, oxidoreductases, lyases, ligases, transferases, and classifications. Um, there's some terminology. So we have um, um, an apoenzyme would be the protein part of an enzyme, assuming that there's a non-protein part. Not all enzymes have, um, not all enzymes can be apoenzymes. But some of them require additional pieces, and so when that's the case, um, the protein part's called the apoenzyme. The rest of it's called the cofactor. Now, a cofactor, if it's small metal ion or a small organic molecule, um, in the past we've called them cofactors. If they are large organic cofactors, we actually call them coenzymes. And frequently, B vitamins are um, these coenzymes, big, long, um, organic required portions of an enzyme. Um, they're again required, and we'll talk about some of the roles they, they serve when we start to look at the active site. Um, substrate, this is the molecule that actually binds with the enzyme and gets acted on, and the active site is where that substrate binds. So here we see an enzyme. This enzyme um, here is an apoenzyme, so we can talk about the, the functionality of a cofactor here. So this apoenzyme, if you'll notice, is not the exact right shape for the substrate. The substrate is going to bind in here, right, to like this region or something, um, but it's missing a piece. So that's where the coenzyme comes in. And a lot of enzymes have vitamin B or some metal ion or something um, required to also be present to facilitate substrate binding. So you can see in, the, in this version down here, uh, the coenzyme molecule has already been added. And now the substrate is going to recognize its little spot there in the active site. And so um, we get enzyme um, substrate binding. And that's the first step in, uh, in catalyzing a reaction. This, um, this, rea this, this interaction between the substrate molecule and the uh, active site could be thought of as lock and key, meaning one molecule fits exactly perfectly just like your key fits into a lock, it only turns, you know, one uh, set of tumblers but doesn't open every door. Um, or induced fit, meaning it's not perfect, it's not a perfect fit, um, but that depending on what, how, how strongly the binding is, um, will get more or less activity. Um, a good example of lock and key is when we said that there are certain enzymes that only work on one substrate like that one um, molecule that only, uh, that one enzyme that only works on urea, that would be a lock and key type scenario where urea is the specific key and the enzyme has a specific active site which would look like the lock. Um, there are also other types of binding and a good example though it's not an enzyme is your taste buds. So we have sugar detectors on our tongue. Those sugar detectors can detect a wide range of carbohydrates, right? There are some carbohydrates that taste sweeter others that don't taste as sweet. And it's not that we have receptors for every kind of carbohydrate out there, even the ones that scientists make in the lab and stick into artificial sweeteners. We don't have those. We just have a general sugar detector and it has uh, an induced sort of fit. So if this was on your taste bud and this is where the sugar molecule fits, it's willing to accept sugar molecules of lots of different shapes. And the ones that fit perfectly are going to give us really, really sweet tastes and the ones that don't fit so perfectly are going to give us less sweet tastes, right? So induced fit kind of works like that. Sorry, it's not an enzyme example uh, and more of just a receptor binding example. 
Um, some more terms. So activation is what it's called when we can turn on an enzyme to get it to increase its activity. Inhibition is what it's called when we decrease that activity. Um, there is different types of inhibition. There can be competitive inhibition. This is where a molecule that's going to be the inhibitor um, actually competes with the substance, the substrate, um, for the active site. Um, and then there's non-competitive, which is, uh, um, uh, uh, again, as it implies, there's no competition for the active site, but instead the inhibitor um, can actually go and bind to a different spot on the enzyme. We call that um, a different site or allo steric. These are old words for different site. Um, let me see if there's a slide that I can use to talk about what I want to talk about. I guess it's going to come back. We're going to, so I want to get to this, but there's a little bit before it, so let's not get ahead of ourselves. So inhibitors, activators. All right. Um, the way that we measure whether an activator or inhibitor is actually doing that activation or inhibition um, is we look at the activity of the enzyme. And so we need to talk about how enzyme activity is sort of, um, um, how, how, how the general enzyme activity plot looks and then the effects uh, or the factors that affect um, that plot. So um, enzyme activity is usually shown as either a um, function of the concentration of enzyme versus the rate of the reaction. Um, you'll see that we can also do this with substrate down here. We can look at the substrate concentration. Now, um, rate is usually, now that's a kinetics, and this is not something that we're going to talk about here, but uh, we would need to be able to monitor how much of a, re of a uh, a product versus reactant there is and so there are cer certain model systems that we can use for example we can have a substance that reacts with light of a particular wavelength um, let's say you know 200 nanometers um, and if that reacts and turns into you know two little products that both don't react with light so light doesn't inter interact with them um, then we could see the absorbance of the 200 nanometer wavelength disappear, meaning at the beginning of the reaction, we would see a lot of our light being absorbed by the molecules, but at the end of the reaction, we wouldn't see any of that light being absorbed. And that would just be evidence that the reaction happened, that this molecule here turned into these guys. And so there are systems we can study using light. There are systems where, you know, this is orange and the products are clear, right? And so if we watch the orange color disappear, we can see that the reaction's happening and how fast the orange color disappears can tell us something about how fast the reaction's happening, right? If it disappears really fast, then that was a really good rate. If it disappears really slowly, then that's not a good rate. And so that's how we can study this. Now, let's look at the things that affect how fast a reaction happens. Now, enzyme concentration is directly proportional to rate. The more enzyme we put in, the more this reaction happens. And that should make sense. The enzyme is the thing actually going in and doing the job, right? Catalyzing this reaction. We call it the turnover. Enzymes that have really high rate have really high turnover. They make lots of product. Uh, so enzyme rate, uh, enzyme concentration affects the rate. And that's ever increasing, right? Assuming that there's plenty of substrate around. Obviously, if there's no substrate for them to work on, there would be no reaction. So if there's lots of substrate, um, the more enzyme, the, the faster the rate. And that goes, you know, sky's the limit. Now, as far as substrate concentration, this one's a little different. Our bodies, right, um, usually have a set amount of enzyme. So we don't just have unlimited enzyme. So what happens is um, substrates, when you start to increase the amount of substrate, initially the, the enzyme um, starts doing its job really, really fast, and we get really, really rapid um, increase in rate. We kind of call this... Uh, first order kinetics or second order kinetics. I'm going to call it second order because um, I think that one makes a little more sense. Second order kinetics means that as we increase the rate of, or let's just say it this way, if I was to double the substrate concentration, meaning if I went from, you know, one molar uh, to two molar, just doubling it, what we're actually going to get is a quadrupling of the, um, the rate. So it's, it's logarithmic. Initially, that's what happens until we get to a point. You'll see that this actually plateaus and then sort of levels off. What happens here is that we've reached 
what we call the maximum rate because we're out of enzyme. At this point, every single enzyme molecule is busy. Every single enzyme molecule has a substrate already. And adding more substrate, they're just going to have to wait for an enzyme that's free. And so that's why this levels out. So we call this zero order kinetics up here zero order because adding more substrate does not affect the rate so enzyme gets maxed out now in terms of temperature pH that kind of stuff um, every enzyme has an optimal and so we know from the protein chapter that if we go too hot too hot uh, the temperature too high we're gonna disrupt those hydrogen bonds that are holding our secondary and tertiary structures together our, our enzyme our protein will unfold and an unfolded protein does not do an enzyme job. And so every organism has a, a nice little range at which the enzyme is going to be the most active. Of course, if we start off at a really low temp, everything is really slow. Well, the rate is slow because things are moving very slowly. So, so that's the reason everything's slow. And that's why we put our food in the refrigerator. We want all those bacteria on our food to have their enzymes going very, very slow so that they don't spoil our food very fast. As things warm up, and start to bounce around more and move around more and bounce into each other more. Enzymes start to see substrates a lot more often. And so the rate goes up to a maximum temperature and then it's ideal. And then if you go beyond that temperature, we see a decrease in activity because enzymes now are falling apart and they're not being able to do their job. So denaturing. pH is the same. Um, uh, Different from temperature in that the enzyme isn't denatured at low temperatures, here in pH, the enzyme is denatured anywhere outside of that optimum range. And again, this disrupts, disrupts the tertiary um, structure. Changes to pH change the charges on those amino groups, those R groups, and those can stop being ionic, they can stop being hydrogen bonding, they can stop with the salt bridges, uh, and the enzyme falls apart. And so we have some enzymes like amylase in our mouth, that our mouth is around, you know, six point something, seven pH. Amylase starts to break down sugar directly in your mouth when you eat food. Um, and then you swallow a lot of that and it goes into your stomach. Well, your stomach's about a pH of two. So all that amylase that you had that was working, it all just stops working in your stomach. On the other hand, we have um, uh, chymotrypsin and trypsin, which are uh, digestive enzymes um, for proteins that get made in the body at around pH 7 and they don't they're not properly folded Then they get dumped into the stomach and at pH of 2 they fold properly and then they start doing the job in the stomach So every enzyme is going to have a different optimum pH range All right, so the way that an enzyme works is it's going to bind the substrate once in the active site of the enzyme um, the reaction is going to take place we're going to look over some of the, the specifics in a second. In the lock and key model, again, um, it fits perfectly into the active site. In the induced fit mechanism, we can see that the active site does not specifically match the substrate, but they fit together anyways. Now, in terms of um, inhibition or um, activation, uh, let's talk about inhibition first. Um, inhibition can be competitive, meaning that the inhibitor competes for the active site, um, like the substrate. So often the inhibitor is structurally similar to the active site, or I'm sorry, structurally similar to the substrate. So um, in medicine, when we try to make uh, drugs that we're going to go and inhibit a particular enzyme or a particular um, substrate, we often make them structurally similar. That way they compete. You can see here, the inhibitor is bound to the enzyme, and now the substrate can't bind. Um, in allosteric inhibition, which is another version of inhibition, allosteric meaning the um, other site. Now, not every enzyme is susceptible to this kind of inhibition. If they are, they're called allosteric enzymes. Um, but there's just another site somewhere on the enzyme that the inhibitor binds to, and by doing that, it changes the shape of the active site. So you see here, this active site had this little, well, you can see that it's, it matches the substrate. After inhibition, the active site changes. And so now it's got slightly different form. 
and so it's not going to exactly match up with the substrate and it's not going to work anymore and so um, just to mention activation can also be done this way you could start off with an enzyme that has an active site that doesn't match the substrate you can have an activator come and land on the allosteric site and this and the active site will change to now match the substrate and so you can turn enzymes on and off in this manner all right let's talk a little bit about the mechanism of action here so in the presence of inhibitors presence of um, uh, sorry uh, or the absence of inhibitors so presence and absence of inhibitor so in the red line here we see a normal curve for reaction rate versus substrate concentration. We see it increasing initially, and then it kind of flattens out towards the top where we hit our maximum reaction speed uh, due to the enzyme being um, completely saturated. There's no more available enzyme. Now, in the presence of an in a competitive inhibitor, we see that the rate obviously lowers, but if you continue to add substrate, you can still see that the rate can still reach its max so um, and the reason for this is that uh, initially right some of this competitive inhibitor is taking up the active site on the enzyme and so that reaction is kind of stalling out um, but because substrate and the competitive inhibitor are going after the same spot if we just increase the amount of substrate we can eventually overcome um, and kind of fight back against that comp um, competitive inhibitor and uh, and max out the enzyme again now, non-competitive inhibition, because it goes for a different spot on the enzyme and changes the active site so that the enzyme no longer recognizes substrate, then increasing the substrate concentration does not make up the difference um, in that reaction rate. And so just by looking at curves of inhibition or curves of um, activity, we can tell if an inhibitor is competitive or not by whether or not the curve can still reach the max or if it'll never reach the max. If it never reaches the max again, that's non-competitive, meaning an allosteric inhibition. Um, if we can still get to the max using um, increased substrate, then that means it's competitive. So we can study these curves and learn about what type of inhibition is, is actually happening. Now, um, this is interesting. Um, lock and key model and induced fit, both um, are, are players in, in the theory on how different enzymes work. In fact, there are some enzymes that are thought to be more induced fit and other enzymes that are more lock and key. Um, inside the active site, which is again the, the spot where the, cat, the catalysis is happening, the catalytic activity, um, it's interesting that there's just five amino acids that tend to be very, very prevalent there. Um, histidine, cysteine, um, aspartate, arginine, and glutamate. These guys um, cysteine having a, a thiol group and histidine and arginine being basic and aspartate and glutamate um, being acidic, these are very, very um, active um, uh, amino acid residues. They're reactive, that's what I should have said, not active, they're reactive. And so we tend to see them in the active state um, more often than not. Um, we're not going to go into any um, actual reactions and look at how they work, but um, the being in the, the acid or base portion of these guys um, acts like the acid and base catalysts that we usually see in regular non-biological reactions. All right, now the way that we say enzymes work is that they lower the activation energy required for the reaction to take place. And so this is a typical energy diagram showing you the, en the, the energy of the reactants. So, you know, right here on the energy level. This is the energy level, by the way. Um, products are way down here, lower in energy. The fact that reactants turn into products of lower energy is, is um, one of the laws of, of thermodynamics, the spontaneous uh, reactions. Anything that's spontaneous is going to have a lower energy at the end. Um, but before the reactants can go from one energy to the um, products at a lower energy, they have to go through a transition state. And that transition state is usually much higher energy um, than either of those two. And so the difference between the, the reactants energy and the transition state energy is referred to as the activation energy. And this is, again, this is energy required to get two molecules to hit each other with just the right energy and the right orientation. Um, 
uh, and again to form uh, a, a, a transition state, which is a kind of a half a halfway from one of the reactants into the product. What an enzyme does is it usually creates a surface or it um, brings the two molecules together in just the right way. One way or another, it just lowers the energy that's needed. And so that's what we say um, it's doing by lowering the activation energy. So over here with the enzyme, we see that the, the, the halfway point is actually much lower in energy than if there was no enzyme present. And again, the reason for this can be because the enzyme brings all the molecules close together, lines them up in the right way, they're all in the active site, um, that's a much more um, uh, ideal setup for making a reaction happen than just having everything randomly floating around. Um, and so this is why enzymes work. They're able to lower that activation energy, which makes the reaction happen faster. The reactants turn into products quicker. Um, and so then this is why they're, you know, 10 to the 8 times uh, faster than the uncatalyzed reaction. There's a few ways that enzymes are regulated. So let's talk about those. One of the ways is something called feedback control. Um, and this is usually a negative thing, so negative feedback. Um, let's say that you have um, enzyme E1 that turns A into B, and then enzyme E2 turns B into C, and enzyme E3 turns C into D. And um, your, your body wants to have lots of D uh, available. Okay. Well, once you start to make enough D, and there's lots of D floating around, what happens is, is that this product acts as a negative inhibitor for enzyme number one. So it'll come and it'll bind to, let's say, the allosteric site of enzyme one and actually put a stop to the reaction of A into B because you don't want to have A always making D. Your body doesn't need that much D, let's say. And so when D is enough, it stops the reaction. Now, as D gets used up and it gets broken down and all the things your body normally does, um, then there's just less D floating around. And so now there isn't as much D inhibiting enzyme E1. And so now enzyme E1 is uninhibited and free to allow this reaction to happen again. And so then we start to make more D again until it is back to normal levels and then it goes and inhibits again. So this is feedback inhibition where uh, a late product of a reaction or a series of reactions goes and inhibits an early enzyme. And this could be competitive or non-competitive. D could go and be a competitive inhibitor, bind at the active site, or it can be allosteric. So feedback control. Um, another type of regulation is the, the formation of things called proenzymes. Proenzymes are enzymes that are formed um, but that are non-functional yet. And I mentioned um, we have some digestive enzymes like trypsin, which is formed as a trypsinogen, and it doesn't do any enzyme activity only after it becomes um, hydrolyzed. So six amino acids have to be cut off and removed from the end terminal of this chain. And when that little bit gets cut off, now it folds properly and it becomes active. Um, there are other molecules like chymotrypsin, which form as chymotrypsinogen. And it takes two um, particular cleavings, one by pepsin um, and then one by itself, to make it into its final um, to its final form where it can actually work. And your body does this for a lot of reasons, right? It doesn't make trypsin in the stomach or in the intestines. It makes it inside your body where other peptides are. So you don't want trypsin when it's made to be going and breaking down your proteins around where it was made. So you make it as an inactive form. Then you transport it to where it's going to do the job and you activate it. And then, then you let it go and do everything it's going to do. So this is how your body regulates the activity of the enzyme, it just doesn't let it be active yet. So zymogens are what it's called when we have a um, precursor to the enzyme. Um, as far as regulation goes, um, allosterism is what we've been talking about when, a, when an enzyme can be regulated by that allosteric site. Then it's called an allosteric enzyme. Um, allosteric enzymes have multiple polypeptide chains or often have multiple polypeptide chains. Um, where one change to one of the chains affects the rest of the molecule, and eventually all of the chains um, might take on a different um, configuration. And we'll look at a picture in a second. 
So negative modulation is turning off of an allosteric enzyme. Positive mod modulation would have been like an activator stimulation of an allosteric enzyme. And a regulator is what negative and pos positive modulation or modulators would be. Um, so let's take a look at kind of how that would work. So our regulator here, um, our, our allosteric enzyme, is going to come in here, bond to another spot, change the active site, and now it's activated or it's um, inhibited. So if, if this new active site perfectly matches um, you know, some substrate, well then this just got turned on, it's an activator. If this now changed the, sub, uh, the active site and now a substrate doesn't fit in there, well then it's an inhibitor. Uh, but that's what it means to have um, the allosteric binding and the change to the active site. Now here um, is where I, we can get into the uh, other chains. So we, could, we can imagine here that these molecules, that this enzyme has two chains. This is one half, and this is the other half. Um, Yeah, and so this book doesn't actually get into concerted or sequenced um, uh, changing, um, but what we can say here um, is that sometimes the two chains will change at the same time. Sometimes a change to one chain will lead to a change in the other chain. Um, that's not really the, the subject of this, though, so let's just kind of stop talking about the two chains here. Um, in, in, in other versions, in my biochem class, we go into a little bit more about um, the differences in the chains and how the chains react. But let's not talk about that here. So um, what this is showing is that there's often two forms of an enzyme. There's the relaxed form, designated R, and there's the tight form, designated T. Now the tight form um, isn't going to bind substrate as often, and the relaxed form does bind substrate more often. And these exist in an equilibrium with each other, an equilibrium between the T form and the R form. Now what happens is, let's say that there's um, uh, an activator. So an activator is actually going to come and bind to one of the chains of our relaxed form and create a situation where we no longer, so just to be clear, um, unbound R and unbound T are the ones in um, equilibrium with each other. So when unbound R either binds a substrate or binds an activator, it becomes a different complex, an activated complex or a, a substrate bound complex. Um, both of these things can happen together. It can bind substrate on its own. It can bind the activator first and then bind substrate. Ultimately, it leads to um, this form. Now, R bound to these guys removes the uh, a current amount of unbound R, right? And if you remember from Chem 3A, Le Chatelier's principle says, if you disturb equilibrium, it tries to reestablish it. So if we start to remove unbound R from this side of the equation, then more of the T form will start to turn into R. And so essentially, activators create more enzyme that's able to do work. Now let's look at how um, inhibition works with all of this, because that's activation. Let's look at inhibition. Inhibition is going to actually bind to the T form more than the R form and create a T form that no longer is unbound. So we're removing now unbound T from this equilibrium, creating a tight form that's bound to an inhibitor. Well, that's going to shift the equilibrium this way and cause a lot more of the relaxed form to turn into the, the tense form. So inhibitors and activators shift the equilibrium of these two forms of the protein. Um, and this is another way that we say regulation happens. So inhibitors and activators can literally change the active site and turn this on or off, but they can also shift the equilibrium. So just to recap, activators and inhibitors, in addition to binding at allosteric sites and changing the active site or competing directly with the substrate, can also regulate enzyme activity by Con by converting relaxed forms into tight forms, which bind less by shifting the equilibrium, or by converting tight forms into relaxed forms, again, by shifting the equilibrium. 
so just another enzyme regulation. There's also protein modification in terms of um, post-translational modifications. Um, we know that sometimes amino acids can be modified after they've been incorporated into the protein chain. Uh, we looked at hydroxylations, methylations, acetylations, carboxylations. All of these things can happen. But one of the main um, for protein activity is phosphorylation, adding a phosphate group um, or removing a phosphate group. And the class of enzymes that usually do this are called kinases. And so um, in this example, we've got um, pyruvate kinase is the active form of an enzyme. So pyruvate kinase. Um, but we want to turn it off by phosphorylating it. And so pyruvate kinase will get an additional phosphate group added to it. That phosphate group comes off of the adenosine triphosphate into diphosphate, right? So it loses a phosphate group. So this costs some energy. Anytime we use um, phosphorylation, this comes from ATP or GTP or CTP, one of the energy molecules we have. Um, and now um, this phosphorylated form of pyruvate kinase is inactive. And then to turn it back on, something has to come in here and remove that phosphate group and it turns back on. That's one way phosphorylation works, where in this example, phosphorylation turns this enzyme off and dephosphorylation turns it back on. There's other examples where we phosphorylate enzymes to turn them on and dephosphorylate them to turn them off. So um, there's not a, a, a one thing to memorize here that phosphorylation turns enzymes off or that it turns them on, it's just that it can do both and it can regulate the protein activity. Isoenzymes are also different forms of enzymes that exist in different parts of our bodies. And usually this happens when they have multiple chains. So for example, um, just to give you an idea of isoenzymes, um, our bodies have hemoglobin, it transports oxygen. We have two alpha chains, two beta chains. Well, babies have two alpha chains and two gamma chains. They have a slightly different um, chain, um, which leads to an isoenzyme, uh, or I guess it wouldn't be an isoenzyme because hemoglobin is not really catalyzing anything. But in this example, it's an isomer. Um, it's a different variant of the same molecule, um, and, it, and in this case, in a different person, right, in the baby. Um, isoenzymes are similar in, in that they might have different chains. They still do the same job, but they might be located in different regions of the body. So for example, um, lactate dehydrogenase. This thing um, we looked at as an example earlier. This has a couple of chains. It's a tetramer, so four chains. It's got um, H chains and M chains. Well, if they're all H, H, so H4 would be the designation, we find that in the heart muscle. Um, if it's all M's, we find that in the skeletal muscle. Any variation, so like 3H and 1M, half and half, 1H and 3M, we find in different parts of the body. Um, some of them are, ver are, are susceptible to different regulation. H4 is allosterically inhibited. M4 is not allosterically inhibited. Um, we can also use, so in addition to there just being different regulations of different enzymes in different parts of the body, and again, this is, a, this is um, facilitated by different chains. You could actually think of this as activity that was programmed into these enzymes, right? Somebody programmed, hey, I want this enzyme to do this job in the heart, and I want it to be regulated this way. But I also want this enzyme to do, to do stuff in the muscle, but I don't want it regulated the same way. And so they programmed the different chain to remove that regulation. I mean, I'm saying someone, um, nature is one version of that, right? Um, but again, very, very um, fine-tuned. One more thing to say about isoenzymes is that they're often um, used as diagnostic tools. So whenever somebody, let's say, has a heart attack, um, we can go and look at levels of, of, of lactate dehydrogenase to see if there's an increase in a particular isoenzyme. And sometimes seeing an increase in, let's say, the H4 indicates damage to the heart. We're seeing an increase in the isoenzyme M4 would indicate more of a muscle damage. So here you can see um, five different isomers um, of the um, lactate dehydrogenase. And again, depending on whether or not um, the chains are M's or H's, we see that it shows up in different parts of the body. 
And so when there is um, an increase in these enzymes um, detected, they can often signal trauma or, or, or um, damage to those types of tissues. Um, and again, because they're probably looking at your blood, and these things wouldn't be in the blood, they'd be in the tissues. But when cells get damaged, um, these things spill out and start to be detected in the blood. And so then seeing which t isomer you know, shows up tells you which part of the body's got uh, damage to it. Enzymes are also used um, uh, as, as diagnostic tools. Um, in addition to like what we just talked about um, and looking at you know, levels of, of lactate dehydrogenase, we can also look at other um, enzymes. So increases in creatine phosphokinase or phosphohexoisomerase can, lead, can indicate heart attack. Um, seeing aspartate aminotransferase increase can lead to um, or can show hepatitis or heart attack. Uh, prostate cancer can be detected with acid uh, phosphatase increase in the serum and so on. Lastly, um, there's a neat thing that happens when we look at molecules that resemble the transition state. So remember um, in the energy diagram we have you know, something that looks like this. Um, our reactants are here, our products are lower, we have the activation state, and in an enzyme, you know, the activation energy might be a little lower, but the molecule is usually a hybrid, um, not a hybrid, transition, a middle, uh, a middle in the, the transformation between the reactant to the product. And what happens is, um, what somebody found out was if you created molecules that look like the transition state, and then you let the body create antibodies against them, these antibodies often had catalytic activity, meaning that the antibody would kind of act like an active site, and it would go and bind with the transition state of the molecule you made, and then it would do a reaction on it. And so these scientists basically uh, proved this in the late 80s, um, so here's an example. L-proline gets converted into D-proline. Okay, in the, in the halfway state, the transition state, it goes. Uh, this carbon right here goes from being tetrahedral to planar. So this is 120 degrees around, and it's flat in a plane. And then it goes back to being tetrahedral again. Four different bonds, 109 degree angles. Well, if you make a molecule that's flat like that that looks like the transition state and then let the body create antibodies for it, um, those antibodies show up with catalytic activity and will actually, you know, do a reaction on this to make it kind of look like that. Um, and so those antibodies that have catalytic activities are called abzymes. Um, and so again, they're made by, by exposing the body to transition state analogs, molecules that look like that halfway point um, and then they show up. And so this is a particular one. This is a transition analog um, for uh, a reaction that we'll look at on the next screen, the next slide. So here, so again, this is N-alpha phosphopyridoxal. Sorry. And so in this, uh, in this case here, um, in the presence of D-alanine, um, and this pyridoxal, this, this transition state compound, um, an antibody was formed, right? This antibody now is the abzyme. Because it's been formed to this guy right here, dialanine, okay, is, is a transition state. Dialanine has a transition state in its reaction to pyruvate that looks like pyridoxal 5, you know, this thing right here. So because this antibody specifically recognizes the transition state of this guy, hence what alanine would look like in the middle of its reaction, it can actually catalyze the reaction of dialanine into pyruvate. There would normally be a different enzyme that does that, right? An enzyme, a protein um, whose specific job is this. But because antibodies are your body's way of fighting invaders, if you put an invader that looks like the transition state, the antibody acts like an active site all by itself without the rest of the protein. Very, very neat. And so these are kind of like designer proteins. If you have a reaction you want to happen, 
and you know what the transition state looks like, you can create an abzyme that'll do the job. Um, and that's about it. All right, guys. So that was the enzyme chapter. Um, I hope you could follow that. It wasn't a very long chapter. Hope you're doing your reading. Um, but I will be posting another video um, pretty soon. So um, email me if you have questions. Post questions to the discussion board if you can. And uh, I'll see you guys next time.